trying, you'll get a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Or one of these. I don't want you to overindulge here. Oh, Good afternoon. Today's uh, hearing is uh, uh, a very important one. And uh, for the purposes of our orderly um, 
proceeding on uh, today's hearing, I think it's very important for us to uh, conduct a little bit of uh, housekeeping. And uh, it is very important for us to keep the uh, aisles uh, clean and clear, if we could. And so what I'd ask uh, on either side is if you could compress back a, a, a somewhat uh, uh, more towards the rear of the, um, of the hearing room, each of you. Uh, who are standing in the aisles, you would uh, very much help us to uh, comply with uh, some of the uh, concerns which the other the people who are seated have with regard to their ability to uh, be able to witness uh, today's uh, proceedings. And uh, would thank uh, each of you, if uh, you could, in the aisles, uh, comply with that request throughout the course of the uh, hearing. Today's hearing is Congress's first public examination of the stunning revelations concerning illegal activity in the government securities market by senior officials of Solomon Brothers Incorporated. Clearly, all investors and taxpayers have a direct stake in the fairness of the most important financial market which we have, a $2.3 trillion market, one which provides the fuel for the nation's fiscal engine. This subcommittee's inquiry will not constrain itself to illuminating the darkness of Solomon Brothers' activities. We will be examining the following. First, not only what happened at Solomon Brothers, but why? Was there a corporate culture at work or a climate of permissiveness? Second, are these revelations reflective of more widespread unethical or illegal activities in this market? And third, how did regulators respond to what happened? And what are they doing now? And finally, what can Congress do to prevent such activity from happening anywhere in the market in the future? This subcommittee began its own inquiry into the government securities market last September, when Representative Cooper and I wrote to the SEC Chairman Breeden requesting a comprehensive examination of problems in this market and the need for legislative reform. In May of this year, the subcommittee's first hearing on this issue focused on abusive sales practices in the secondary government securities market. In conjunction with that hearing, the subcommittee released a report from the Resolution Trust Corporation that identified at least 37 SNLs which lost a combined $620 million in the government securities market and whose ultimate failure and taxpayer bailout was directly linked to those losses. Finally, on June 3rd, I wrote to the SEC, the Treasury Department, and the Fed seeking a full investigation of allegations of manipulative activity in the primary market, leading to a squeeze in the secondary market. The Solomon revelations relate directly to the areas of inquiry in that letter. The admissions of wrongdoing at Solomon not only reveal an arrogant disdain for the law by former Solomon Brothers officials, but cut right to the heart of concerns about the adequacy of regulation in the market itself. We must be assured that all wrongdoers will be identified and punished, and more importantly, that there will be a true change in the culture of an institution which clearly went awry. With regard to the role of the federal government and the need for regulatory change, a broader reevaluation is in order. Unlike other securities markets, there is a very different oversight scheme that governs this market. And this scandal raises concerns over its value in serving the interests of taxpayers and investors. For example, can we continue to rely on an essentially private business relationship between the New York Fed and a limited number of privileged primary dealers with no set of codified rules. As for the enforcement of the laws, we rely on the SEC to be the cop. But compared with the SEC's vastly superior surveillance authority in other markets, in this area the SEC is a cop with no nightstick and no map of the streets on the beat. In my view, we need to consider a legislative agenda 
that directly attacks the weakest areas of regulatory oversight in this marketplace. First, the SEC and appropriate regulatory agencies should be given the authority to write sales practice rules to govern the relationship between broker-dealers and their customers and government securities. Second, the SEC should be given the authority to oversee the manner in which price and trading information gets to the public and regulators. Third, firms which participate in this market should be mandated to abide by standard internal procedures which act as the front line against illegalities. This would follow the model set in the Insider Trading Bill of 1988, which I authored along with Chairman Dingell and Representative Ronaldo. Fourth, consideration should be given to some form of large trader reporting for customers in this market in order to gauge better where major positions are in the market. Fifth, the SEC's general anti-fraud authority should be augmented to make explicit that any fraudulent or manipulative activity in the auction process is a violation of the securities laws. And finally, consideration should be given to formalizing the cooperation amongst the SEC, the Treasury, and the Fed over this marketplace. There is much work still to be done by the government agencies investigating the facts of the Solomon Brothers case and by those of us in Congress seeking both to prevent any such recurrence and to improve the fundamental fairness and integrity of this market. I expect that this hearing and the lessons of Solomon Brothers will set us squarely on the path of developing tough, common sense government securities market reform legislation. That concludes the opening statement of the chair. Now I'll turn to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank, you <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you for holding today's hearing on what has been appropriately referred to as a Solomon Brothers case. To the public, this is probably a complicated issue involving arcane trading practices of one of Wall Street's most prestigious firms. But stripped of all of the language of Wall Street's bond traders, what the public, what my constituents, what the people of this country want to know is simply this. Are the American people, who ultimately are responsible for paying off these government securities, being ripped off by a few aggressive traders manipulating the market? In effect, was Solomon Brothers' chief bond trader trying to corner the market to squeeze out competitors to unfairly and illegally enrich the company and perhaps also determine in advance interest rates that affect other securities? And why didn't those at the top of Solomon Brothers report it as soon as they found it out? These are not easy questions to answer. And it's distressing that Solomon Brothers' chief officers withheld the information from the government for months before a government inquiry finally persuaded them to come forward with some of the facts. What else is missing from the puzzle? Before members of this subcommittee can determine how the regulations government, governing the government securities trading practices should be changed, we know, need to know the full story of who was at fault, how it happened, why it took so long to report, and if these practices were an isolated incident or if they are more widespread. For years, this subcommittee has been told that the industry polices itself, that more and more regulations inhibit the free market and are difficult and expensive to enforce. Well, I'd like to know whether or not this is a case of one bad apple in a barrel, or are there more? It's deeply troubling to me to learn that Solomon Brothers, one of Wall Street's most respected names, had on several occasions violated the Treasury's rules on bidding and apparently created several short squeezes. These actions are unconscionable, and this Congress and the American public will not tolerate a repetition of this reprehensible and arrogant behavior. That's one reason why I'm pleased that the Securities and Exchange Commission is broadening its probe to look into bidding practices of both commercial and investment banks. The SEC is attempting to determine whether there is widespread collusion occurring in connection with Treasury securities auctions. 
And if these allegations are true, our nation's economy has been harmed. Confidence in our capital markets has been eroded. And manipulative activities that undermine the confidence of investors ultimately will drive borrowing costs upward at the expense of the taxpayer. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is an excellent opportunity to begin assessing the status of the Treasury securities markets. I'm not willing to assume at this early stage that the entire dealer community has been engaged in improper activities solely because the SEC is conducting a broad-based investigation. Moreover, I'm pleased to learn that Solomon Brothers has a new top management, which I understand is committed to operating squarely within the law. I know that Warren Buffett and his new team at Solomon Brothers already have instituted procedures to stop abuses, such as preventing unauthorized bidding on behalf of customers. I also believe that the new team at Solomon deserves credit for cooperating fully with federal law enforcement officials and has not stonewalled or denied responsibility for the actions of their predecessors. These are encouraging signs, but we need to take a careful and dispassionate look at what is going on in the nation's biggest securities market. Mr. Chairman, after five years of the Government Securities Act, we have an opportunity now to review this legislation carefully to determine how the market has changed and how our laws should be strengthened to address any newly discovered improper activities. In my opinion, we should alter the Government Securities Act so that it fulfills the goals that I articulated in 1986 of protecting the citizens of this country while avoiding a regulatory scheme that is excessively burdensome and expensive. I want to welcome Mr. Buffett and today's panel of witnesses and look forward to their testimony and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. I thank the chair and I congratulate uh, our chairman uh, for holding these timely hearings. We have a great deal to do uh, before October 1st when the, when the legislation governing these markets uh, comes up for renewal. So it's a very timely hearing and I congratulate Mr. Markey. Uh, government and uh, all of us have traditionally been loath to burden uh, the government bond market with regulations, particularly uh, regulations that really don't seem to be urgent and necessary. After all, this market is supposed to have been the safest, most efficient financial market in the world. And it's a safe haven. And it has been. And we want to keep it that way. Now, the efficacy of this hands-off approach is being questioned improperly. Is this, matter, uh, is this a matter of corporate greed? Is this a matter of uh, obsessive determination to win the game? Is this simply an aberrational uh, occasion that we've run up to? Or is it a corporate environment, a corporate uh, a community failing that has uh, produced these actions? And they're not alone. Looking broadly across the uh, spectrum of corporate markets, we've seen the Ivan Bosky affair, we've seen the uh, Michael Milliken affair, we've seen uh, the Keating affair, and now we see this. Now, most of the people in this room are professionals, uh, and they understand that uh, the SNL scandal isn't exactly the same as the, as the uh, security scandals and the in the uh, uh, that we've seen with uh, Mr. Milliken and Mr. Boskin, and they are in turn different from uh, this serious problem. But to the public out there, I think uh, that is not quite so sophisticated. They're all, uh, it's a mishmash. And I think John Q. Public may be feeling, and we hope he isn't, that there's something rotten in Denmark at the highest echelons of our financial community, and that the leadership somehow or other is flawed. And it's up to us to find out why uh, these things have been happening. Uh, what is there about our corporate financial culture that produces these embarrassing, uh, disgraceful episodes? After all, the, uh, 
the viability of our financial markets uh, uh, is a matter of global concern. We have central bankers from, a from Asia, Japan, uh, uh, Europe, who are uh, major su supporters of our system for, for financing America, so to speak. Uh, we have a $3.7 billion national debt. Excuse me. A $3.7 trillion national debt. Mr. Buffett was <laughs> nodding in, with some concern. $3.7 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, and I think we have to know what the impact is going to be on uh, consumer confidence on the part of bankers, investors, central bankers around the world. How much is this kind of thing likely to afford us, to, to cost us? Uh, if it's only one one hundredth of one percent, you're talking about three hundred and seventy million dollars. Do I have the decimal point right, Mr. Bubba? Uh, if it's one tenth of one percent, then you're talking about three billion, three hundred and seventy million. If by any chance the cost of the consumer dismay and concern about the state of the market was 1%, and I don't for a moment think it will be, then you're talking about $33,700,000,000. Cost to our economy of, of financing America, including support of the uh, national debt. Uh, these are the questions we have to determine, the degree of, of investor uh, disquietude. Uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slattery. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I too would like to um, commend you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing in such a timely fashion. And I would like to welcome my fellow Midwesterner, Mr. Buffett, and my colleague from uh, from Omaha, Mr. Hoagland, also to the committee. It's good to see you all. Uh, as I sit here today, I can't help but think, uh, Mr. Buffett, that you have an opportunity to uh, provide a great service for the taxpayers of this country, for thousands of shareholders of Solomon Brothers, for hundreds of thousands of investors around the world, and for some 8,000 employees of Solomon Brothers around the world also. Needless to say, it's a daunting responsibility and task that lies before you. And as you begin your service, I would uh, urge you to set uh, what you have described, I think, as a Solomon model for dealing with corporate incompetence and uh, corporate greed, but more important, gross negligence on the part of corporate management at the highest levels and blatant violation of a corporate manager's fiduciary obligations to the shareholders, and in this case, corporate criminality. And I'm pleased that, that you have moved quickly to fire the upper managers that uh, appeared to be responsible for this activity and uh, responsible for this scandal. And I only hope that we won't learn in the future about any sweetheart deals with these managers that are being fired now, and I've expressed to you earlier my deep concern about even paying for their defense. And as far as I'm concerned, those responsible deserve absolutely nothing from Solomon Brothers, not a dime in severance pay, not a dime in any kind of remuneration of any kind, and not, not a dime to pay for their defense either. These are sophisticated, well-educated, highly compensated, probably very wealthy people that uh, have embarrassed Solomon Brothers, have discredited the securities markets in this country, and uh, they deserve absolutely nothing but a swift kick in the butt out of Solomon Brothers and onto the street. And I think I would speak for a lot of people in this country in suggesting what they would like to see from some of these people is them in striped suits sweeping the streets of Wall Street for a few months or a few years or a decade and uh, 
uh, that would probably get the attention of others that are so inclined to, to engage in activity of this kind in the future. But uh, I hope that uh, the shareholders of Solomon Brothers will explore the possibility of perhaps a derivative suit or shareholder suit to seek civil uh, uh, damages from those that have been responsible for, the, for this scandal. Um, what I would like to see this hearing focus on, and I think the task of this committee, is to hear from you, to hear from the Treasury, to hear from the Federal Reserve, to hear from the SEC about what can and should be done to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future. And I specifically want to hear from the SEC as to whether they believe that they have adequate legal authority and adequate personnel to police the market today. Does the Treasury have adequate legal authority in this area? Uh, does the Federal Reserve System have adequate legal authority? And these are the questions that I would like to get answered today. And if they don't, and if they don't have adequate personnel to do the job of enforcing the law today, then why hasn't the chief law enforcement officer in this country, the President of the United States, been before the Congress asking for the authority and the resources to get the job done? And once again, I think we see a situation where where we are obviously very disappointed, and the people of this country are very disappointed that this kind of activity has taken place. So, Mr. Buffett, you clearly have a, a great opportunity and a great responsibility, and uh, your past reputation would indicate that you're up for the task. And I wish you well as you, as you commence a difficult responsibility. I look forward to your testimony today. And again, I urge you in the strongest possible way to demonstrate a lot more justice than mercy in dealing with these people that you're dealing with uh, within Solomon Brothers. Gentleman's Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Like uh, most of my colleagues, I have uh, just returned from the uh, county fair circuit all across my district. And as these stories were, were breaking, uh, breaking in northern Ohio, uh, at one of my town hall meetings at the Randolph Fair, uh, Portage County Fair, a gentleman farmer came up to me and uh, he said, uh, waving these clippings under my nose, he said, how'd this happen? Uh, who's, who's minding the store? And I suspect uh, that uh, the look I gave him was the best answer that I, that I could, uh, could engender at the time, and that is, is that apparently no one. The fact is, is that there's probably lots of blame for this to uh, uh, to go around. I, I finger number one, this uh, Reagan-esque regulatory regime that we've had for 11 years in this town, which basically uh, seemingly took its cue from that hit Cole Porter song, Anything Goes. And once the market in which we are told that we must repose so much trust, figures out that anything goes, then everything does. And the only thing that's left are the things that are, that are nailed down. One of the fears that I have is that uh, uh, the market isn't responsive, or the government just doesn't care. Corporate compensation in this anything goes type scheme has been simmering as an issue. We know that uh, greed is good drove some of the decisions and activities that, uh, that, that were taken here. But we've gone way beyond corporate compensation. Mr. Breeden, from whom we're going to hear in a little bit, has testified about reforms needed in this area. It's no longer compensation. It's become a feeding frenzy. I've seen hogs at the trough act with more manners than what the public has been exposed to in the past few weeks, once again, of revelations about what people will do in order to, uh, in order to, to enrich themselves. Uh, the second piece that, uh, that, that troubles me as I look to try to figure out where we need to, to apportion uh, the blame is this cozy atmosphere that exists between a regulator seeming to be, to be dependent on a trader simply because that trader is doing us a service. Well, heavens, 
I just can't help but feel the same way like when I go to these stores and some of these clerks who wait on me think they're doing me a favor by selling me something and taking my money to boot. It doesn't make any sense uh, uh, at all. It's an Alice in Wonderland, uh, turned on its head type approach to government regulation that just, uh, just is amazing to me. This cozy, almost incestuous relationship between those who seek to protect the public and those who want to serve the public uh, uh, is, is amazing uh, uh, to me. Uh, I can't believe that we could come up with any less efficient way than we are doing it today. The last point that I want to make as I sit, sit around and, and try to look at, at how this matter gets, uh, uh, gets fixed is once again an, an unseemly parallel from the savings and loan industry. That scandal, which has had political and economic implications for, for, for this entire country, has once again at its core a philosophical change of direction for which the taxpayers are ultimately going to be responsible. And that is, is that the taxpayer has to bail out potentially any failures that occur here. Not likely to happen because of the stability of the marketplace, uh, but uh, it is a lesson that should not be, uh, not be lost upon us. This uh, trust us philosophy that has driven this town, that is rife in your industry, uh, and upon which this Congress and this committee particularly is going to be asked to, uh, to make more judgments uh, uh, is, uh, is beyond me. Oscar Wilde said uh, a long time ago that life imitates art. Gordon Gecko and Sherman McCoy are alive and well on Wall Street. Bonfire of the Vanities uh, moving from fiction to nonfiction. Greed is good, master of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how we legislate that. What we do do is we encourage more people like Mr. Buffett to get in there and, my colleague said, kick some butt and take some names. But until more of your colleagues, similarly situated, Mr. Buffett, uh, rise to this challenge, then the Gordon Geckos and the Sherman McCoys are going to be the masters of our universe. And that, sir, is a sad day for us all. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. I, I thank the uh, chairman for holding these important hearings. Uh, no less than the United States financial well-being is, is at stake. Clearly, uh, what is at stake it has, is dependent upon the integrity of our primary and secondary dealers. So this. I think it's particularly important that we have these hearings. Uh, when you look at the transgressions that have been committed, in many respects, it's financial treason. It, it in fact, imperil the, the, the well-being of our country. And it's only by Mr. Buffett's intervention are we able to avert uh, and to stop the hemorrhaging at one of the most respected uh, financial institutions in this country. There are clear lessons what has occurred. You have a problem at a financial institution, reminiscent of what we saw in the savings and loan scandal. Related to the fallibility of human beings, the regulators find out, they act ex post facto after the deed, and either they improve the situation or make it worse. I would have to say thus far the regulators have acted appropriately and have not made the situation worse. Because if, if in fact what had occurred Salomon Brothers had been closed down. We might have been in here a few weeks earlier, Mr. Chairman, having an emergency hearing because of an overnight failure of a major institution in this country. Clearly, the too big to fail doctrine would have been tested at its extreme, and the reper repercussions to our economy would have been very, very severe. So fortunately, we've been able to keep a balance, and it's been judicious thus far. And there are lessons in what has occurred. Clearly, we need to tighten regulation, coordinate the oversight between the four government agencies involved here. Greater disclosure is needed with respect to Treasury instruments, particularly in the secondary market. Participants need to be fully informed. We need to stop any collusion in the primary market. But I think 
bottom line here is that we are, as the gentleman from Kansas said, trying to avert this from happening again, clearly by raising the stakes and uh, clearly making out the wrongdoing that has been done. We can avoid that. And again, Mr. Buffett, I want to congratulate you for the leadership that you've brought to this uh, problem. I think it has been a, it has been a very, very important a day for uh, America economy when you stepped in and averted a greater catastrophe. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, now recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding this hearing. I believe that it is both important and timely. I think that it is extremely important that we look into the questions associated with the government securities market uh, while we at the same time analyze and try to review the form that any legislation to deal with the FDIC, the bank failures, and the failure of the bank fund to have adequate resources to meet the challenges that confront it. I'd like to welcome Mr. Warren Buffett to the committee this morning. Mr. Buffett, you're a man of uh, unquestioned integrity, and you hold respect because of the great decency with which you have conducted yourself over the years. It's a matter of some comfort to me that uh, you are going to be in charge of Solomon, and I feel that uh, you will be a great force for good not only there, but elsewhere in the government securities industry. Having said that, market integrity has been severely threatened by behavior which we have seen at Solomon. The committee began its concern over these questions a number of years ago, and it's useful to look back a little bit at history, because as George Santayana tells us, he who refuses to learn from history is doomed to repeat it. In 1986, this committee reported out legislation reforming to a degree the government securities market. When Treasury testified before us in 1985 with government securities firms failing, and hundreds of millions of dollars in losses to investors being undergone, Treasury said there are no problems in the marketplace and that no new regulation was needed. Interestingly enough, we hear the same testimony today from the Treasury Department. And the dealer community, working in concert with the Treasury, were very successful in limiting, in limiting the Government Securities Act to Treasury rule, might, rule writing authority in the area of financial responsibility. It is interesting to note that during those same times, the Treasury lobbied most vigorously and diligently against anti-manipulation rule writing authority being placed anywhere. And they have consistently shown a policy which is very much in keeping with that of the Reagan administration and of this administration of deregulation. Let the good times roll get government out of business, pay no heed to what's going on, the market will take care of everything. But the question is, who then will take care of the public interest, the investors, and the interests of the government? The Treasury has consistently resisted efforts to have proper regulation of banks, savings and loans, and government securities. And time after time, they, in concert with FDIC, FSLIC, the Treasury, uh, rather the control of the Treasury, and the Fed have resisted efforts to address clear evidence of wrongdoing in the financial markets. We can look about and see savings and loans, banks, all of whom are turning out now to be vastly worse than anybody ever predicted or anybody ever thought. And this is as a result of direct failure of supervision by the government supervisory agencies. All we have to do is look. Some, some $750 billion in bad loans made around the world by banks in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, that, that fact alone is of significant concern. Huge loans made for mergers, leverage buyouts, and takeovers. Loans which were made under conditions when prudent economists warn that those same loans probably not only could not be properly serviced by the borrowers, but it was doubtful even in bad time that interests could be paid. The GAO and the Congressional Budget Office have suggested that the bank insurance fund is going to be insolvent by year end. 
Yet, the Congress is being pressed during time of expanding evidence of wrongdoing to move more rapidly and more rapidly towards consideration of legislation not imposing new regulation upon banks, but rather, on the contrary, expanding their opportunities to move into new areas where wrongdoing, incompetence, and rascality will thrive and prosper, and where, again, the public will be called upon to make whole the results of wrongdoing, incompetence, bungling by greedy, avaricious, and incompetent people. It is clear that we are going to have to address the overall question of the bank insurance fund and its solvency. We will meet our responsibilities of addressing the question of what form the new legislation should take in this area. But there are important questions. Should banks be permitted to expand into broad, broad other areas? For example, do we want the Bank of New England to move into first executive or vice versa? Or would we like them to move into Penn Central or into Lockheed or into some other major failing U.S. corporation? As I've said, we will carry out our responsibilities. It would be far better that we were to spend our time dealing with not only ferreting out what the wrongdoing is, but what should be done about it and instilling into the administration a proper determination to see to it that the laws are properly carried out, the public interest is protected, that wrongdoers do not profit at the public expense, and that the markets upon which this nation places so much faith and so much of its treasure and its confidence should be protected against both incompetence, wrongdoing, and disregard of the rules of law. I think that this hearing today, Mr. Chairman, is going to be an important one. It is one which will give us some appreciations of matters which are important to us. I am hopeful that when the Treasury appears before us, uh, that they will be better prepared to give us proper answers to matters of concern that this committee has to discuss in a much more informed and intelligent way some of the questions that this committee has, rather than saying, we do not know where it is in the bill or we think it's there, but we have not looked at the bill of late. Uh, indeed, uh, that is the kind of behavior which reflects small confidence uh, in and upon the Treasury. And it is something which I think should cause caution for the Congress and enable us to understand that perhaps we would be better served to look a little more carefully at this matter before we rush into some of the uh, grand accretions of power to agencies which have found themselves not able to carry out their activities in the area of banking, in the area of public finance, and elsewhere. And so I commend you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome you, Mr. Buffett. This is going to be, I know these are difficult times for you, and we look forward to the benefits of your wisdom as you testify before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Gentlemen's the time has expired, and all time for opening statements by members of the uh, subcommittee has expired. We now turn to our first witness, and that witness uh, is a distinguished one, Mr. Warren Buffett, the new chairman and chief executive officer of uh, Solomon Brothers. Uh, Mr. Buffett is perhaps the nation's most prominent investment guru who has followed the path of the straight, the true, and the fundamental uh, while building his successes. While those values may have seemed to have been out of fashion in the go-go 80s, I have a real sense that they're going to come back with a vengeance in the 1990s. And I hope that uh, you, sir, can help us today to help us to apply those values not only to the job you have in overhauling the Solomon Brothers uh, structure, but also as to how we should overhaul the regulatory structure over the entire government securities of marketplace. Uh, Mr. Buffett is joined at the witness table by our uh, colleague uh, from the state of Nebraska, uh, Peter Hoagland. Uh, Mr. Buffett is from Omaha, and uh, Mr. Hoagland is here as well to uh, give a brief introduction to Mr. Buffett. Welcome, Peter. Ch Ch Chairman Markey, uh, Congressman Ronaldo, and Chairman Dingell, and other members of the subcommittee, it's my pleasure today to introduce one of Nebraska's most illustrious and inspiring citizens, a man who is typical of the people that we grow and nurture in the Midwest and whose abilities we so often contribute to the rest of the country. 
Warren has been called up for a very special tour of duty to guide Solomon Brothers through a crucial time. Nebraskans and Kansans and others in the Midwest have always produced good citizens and leaders who could provide sound advice for New Yorkers. And I know that, and I know that Warren Buffett will not hesitate to speak his mind. You all know Warren's reputation. He is America's premier investment manager. His company, Berkshire Hathaway, is considered to be on the leading edge of efficient, honest, profitable business practices. He is known as the Sage of Omaha, and his investment savvy has been the talk of Wall Street and Washington for years. But Warren Buffett is a very unusual businessman. After all of his successes as CEO and chairman and the largest shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway, he continues to choose to live in a quiet, tree-lined neighborhood in Omaha, and he works in a modest midtown office building instead of moving to some financial center like New York City. Sound evidence, Warren, of your good judgment. And Warren is even more unusual, is an even more unusual CEO. He prepares and files his own tax returns and has done so every year of his life since he was 13 when the money he earned on multiple paper routes pushed him over the minimum amount for filing. I do not know of any boy in America who has filed tax returns based on cash proceeds from paper routes. I think that much of Warren's success can be traced to growing up in Omaha, a beginning that instilled in him the old-fashioned values of integrity, discipline, and character. And Nebraska is full of people like him. Warren's friend Charlie Munger tells the story of a boy whose nickname when he was growing up in Omaha was Boob. As an adult, Boob moved to California and made a big fortune in a big hurry. But enough lessons from Nebraska for today. Warren is here because he has a responsibility of reforming Solomon Brothers for the future and protecting the well-being of the 8,000 employees and their families that have been thrust upon him. He is charged with restoring the public's badly shaken confidence in the integrity of the most important financial marketplace in the world. His honest, low-key style, his respect for the rules and the proper role of government and his keen financial mind will provide Solomon and the financial community reassurance and leadership. There is no more capable or honest person in the country to assume this challenge. It's an important job at a critical time in our nation's history. The country simply will not benefit from the destruction of a company employing 8,000 people for the misdeeds of a few. Instead, those few need to be punished and the company reformed and set straight. Nebraska is being sent in to help Wall Street in this effort, and those of us in Omaha are very proud of the man that has been chosen for this job. Warren? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Buffett, uh, whenever you feel comfortable, pull up to that microphone and uh, please begin. Mine. Is this that? It's working? Yes. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee. I would like to start by apologizing for the acts that have brought us here. The nation has a right to expect its rules and laws to be obeyed, and at Solomon, certain of these were broken. Almost all of Solomon's 8,000 employees regret this as deeply as I do, and I apologize on their behalf as well as mine. My job is to deal with both the past and the future. The past actions of Solomon are presently causing our 8,000 employees and their families to bear a stain. Virtually all of these employees are hardworking, able, and honest. I want to find out exactly what happened in the past so that this stain is borne by the guilty few and removed from the innocent. To help do this, I promise to you, Mr. Chairman, and to the American people, Solomon's wholehearted cooperation with all authorities. These authorities have the power of subpoena, the ability to immunize witnesses, and the power to prosecute for perjury. Our internal investigation has not had these tools. We welcome their use. As to the future, 
The submission of this subcommittee details actions that I believe will make Solomon the leader within the financial services industry in controls and compliance procedures. But in the end, a spirit about compliance is as important or more so than words about compliance. I want the right words and I want the full range of internal controls. But I also have asked every Solomon employee to be his or her own compliance officer. After they first obey all rules, I then want employees to ask themselves whether they are willing to have any contemplated act appear the next day on the front page of their local paper to be read by their spouses, children, and friends with the reporting done by an informed and critical reporter. If they follow this test, they need not fear my other message to them. Lose money for the firm and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Buffett, very much. The chair will recognize himself for a uh, round of questions. Let me, let me begin by uh, asking you the obvious question. Is Mr. Mosier's uh, set of actions and the response of other executives uh, to his actions at Solomon Brothers something which is a sui generis to just those individuals? Or do you think it reflects a larger culture which was uh, allowed to be created during the 1980s, during the era of deregulation, uh, that uh, requires uh, closer attention by Congress uh, and by the firms uh, to ensure that there is a new set of procedures which are put on the books, both official from a governmental perspective uh, and internal from the institution's uh, perspective that ensures that uh, we let all individuals in that marketplace know that business as usual has finally ended in this marketplace. Mr. Chairman, I understand that uh, you're asking the question about the entire industry, uh, as whether these fellows' actions were sui generis, basically. I, and I, Solomon yeah. as well. Well, the I, culture I, that was created that made know. all of these activities possible. We have, we have been looking uh, through 45 auctions. We've, we've had teams of lawyers there. They have not had these powers that regulatory authorities have and which, which I welcome. Uh, we have not found uh, anything beyond what is in the submission, but uh, there, the, the, the place is going to be honeycombed with not only our own investigation but with others, and uh, uh, we will see where that leads. Uh, I know of nothing at, at Solomon uh, that uh, goes beyond what has been put into the submission. It's not over uh, in terms of us looking at, at, at the problem. In terms of whether it's sui generis uh, or whether uh, uh, there's a larger climate that exists in Wall Street, I, I would say to some extent it's in between. I don't think, I don't think that, uh, that uh, uh, the only uh, crimes that have occurred to, in Wall Street have occurred with uh, the people we're talking about in, in, in this submission. I also don't think it is rampant uh, th throughout Wall Street. I think that, uh, I think that huge markets attract people who measure themselves by money, and I think that, uh, I don't think that's the only type of people they attract, but I think that there, there is a special attraction of markets, uh, and if someone goes through life and measures themselves uh, solely by uh, how much money they have or how much money they earned last year, sooner or later they're going to get in trouble, in my view. All right. Well, let me, let me then uh, follow up on your opening statement where you uh, commented that it's not only important to look to the past but also to the future. Right. And uh, ask for your help then in looking at the legislative uh, solutions that uh, might help to ensure that we not, never again see a repetition mm -hmm. of this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do, sir, if I could, is to walk you down a set of issues and to get your uh, sense of whether or not uh, any of these uh, make sense. The first would be mandatory firm procedures. That is, that we mandate them legislatively. Uh, along the lines of the uh, mandatory firm proceeding, uh, uh, protect, uh, 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 safeguards which we mandated uh, to be built into the Insider Trading Act of 1988 in order to monitor those kinds of activities, uh, to require that all firms to deal in government securities internally build a formal system that ensures that that is the first line of defense. Uh, do you believe that that would be something that is an appropriate response from Mr. Congress? Chairman, I have no problem with that. I, I, I would hope that at Solomon we would go beyond anything that uh, 
the regulatory authorities come up with, but I, I, I have no problem with, with tough rules, tough cops, and tough prosecution. Excellent. Uh, secondly, large trader customer reporting. Uh, in response to the uh, market crash in 1987, this committee uh, last year uh, passed a piece of legislation which gives to the appropriate regulators the ability to uh, have access to the large trades that go on out in the marketplace so that on, on an ongoing basis uh, they can have a snapshot of what's taking place uh, in that, those marketplaces. Uh, here, it seems to me, since many of the regulators fly blind without any actual knowledge as to what's taking place in this marketplace, um, we're considering uh, building in a large trader provision here as well so that they can have that information on an ongoing proprietary basis uh, so to have a sense of what's happening in that marketplace. Does that make any sense to you? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure exactly what information uh, the present regulators do obtain, but I, I, I see no problem with, uh, with uh, the appropriate authorities uh, having information about uh, uh, large positions. I think, for example, now that uh, unusual movements in stocks are, are, are monitored by both the New York Stock Exchange and the SEC, and I, there are things that go in and, uh, on in markets that should be watched. I have no problem with that. Okay, thank you. The next uh, point would be making the auction rules a direct violation of the securities laws uh, so that uh, those who might consider uh, engaging in uh, illicit activity in this area understand uh, that there are much more severe penalties under the securities laws uh, which they could invoke if in fact uh, they did uh, cross that line. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, I've never written a statute so I'm not going to try and uh, uh, pick out exactly where, where it should be but I have no trouble with there being very tough penalties administered by very tough people uh, with anybody that fools around with the auction process. And uh, let me, uh, in this area, just finally ask uh, uh, the question of whether or not there should be government authority over how price information is sent out to the public so that there can be some sense of integrity, uh, a greater sense of confidence which investors and the taxpayers can have uh, in the uh, information which is used in this marketplace. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, my impression is that uh, the price information, that, uh, at least as, to me as a purchaser, purchaser of Treasury securities, uh, uh, I, I feel that, that I probably obtain good price in, in information. I think that uh, uh, markets tend to be very close in that arena, and, and, and uh, uh, I, I think I can find out, even though I'm not a, never acted as a dealer or anything of the sort in, in that market, I. I've, I've bought treasuries for my own account. I've bought them for the account of Berkshire Hathaway, and I, I, I think I get good price information. Now, there may be some gap that I don't know about, but, I, but in, in, uh, I, I'm not aware of a, a big gap on price information. Well, the, our problem is that, unfortunately, every investor is not Warren Buffett, <laughs> and every investor does not have the access to information which Warren yeah. Buffett has. And unfortunately, the government happens to be in that situation yeah. right now. Well, the, the government ways, should certainly on an have ongoing the basis, you seem to know more. Uh, than uh, many of the government no. regulators um, uh, the don't. Go and so our, the our, government should have good price information. Our concept I have no here is that if we do it with stocks, we do it with uh, options, we're now going to do it with uh, penny stocks, why not do it here as well? Just mm -hmm. so that information is public and yeah. uh, basically uh, uh, certified by the government without in any way impeding upon uh, any uh, productive business activity. Yeah. I have no problem with the government obtaining good price information. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, just let me ask you one uh, final uh, set of uh, inquiries, and that would be this. The, could you provide to the members of this committee uh, the following information in writing uh, by the close of business uh, on Tuesday, September 10th? A detailed accounting of the profit acquired by Solomon Brothers Incorporated resulting from transactions from the following four auctions. December 27, 1990, February 7, 1991, February 21, 1991, April 25, 1991, and May 22, 1991. An accounting of any compensation that Mr. Mosier personally received in each of these transactions. A duplication of all corresponding documentation held by Solomon for these auctions, including all tender forms provided to the firm by the Federal Reserve 
as well as a reconciliation of the estimated bids and actual bids. And finally, a review of the 45 auctions that Solomon has reviewed internally, including the total Solomon bid and award, the total customer bid and award, and the individual customer bid and awards. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to ask um, Mr. Denham to comment on the feasibility of providing everything you've uh, asked for by September 10th. I mean, I simply, uh, I, I, going back to your first point about the profit, for example, on the on the uh, transactions, uh, that that sounds like a very easy proposition, but th there can be offsetting positions in terms of. Uh, of, of, of future transactions, there can be movements in the general market which would, which would cause any government security owned. We are in the process, as I understand it, we are in the process right now of working with the SEC to develop a model that will give us and them uh, the best information we can uh, about that uh, uh, question of just what money was made by, by Mr. Mosier's uh, misdeeds and, and uh, uh, and or what money was lost. I understand some money was lost, but I don't necessarily believe that until I see the model. Uh, you can understand, Mr. Buffett, from our perspective, right. this information is the key information which we need in order to develop motivations on the part of the individuals yeah. in the marketplace that then help us to accurately frame the legislation uh, to ensure that there are no repetitions. Mr. And Chairman, I, you, you, you've got you, my total cooperation. I just don't know in terms of September 10th. I, I don't want to make any promises to you I can't keep. Well, and is Mr. Denham here? Yeah, Mr. Denham. Mr. Mr. Denham, could you uh, provide us the information to the best of your ability as available by uh, September 10th? We will provide all information to the best of our ability. The, uh, most of it, uh, most of the items... Can you move the microphone over? The, yeah. Uh, Mr. Dunham, please. Push that button forward. Mr. Chairman, we will provide the information you've requested to the best of our ability by September 10th. Uh, most of the items uh, that you requested, uh, I believe, uh, we should be able to provide by then. Uh, as Mr. Buffett stated, the information about uh, the, the profits from each auction is a little more complex. We will submit that to you as well as we can and as quickly as we can. Uh, the information about compensation uh, as it relates to these auctions of Mr. Moser, that I think is not difficult and, and should be able to be presented quite quickly. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Buffett, very Thank much. You. My time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Buffett, did the Board of Directors of Solomon Brothers approve golden parachutes for Mr. Gutfriend, Strauss, or Merriweather? No, sir, they did not. Thank you. Um, your testimony, the written testimony that you provide, it's, says that senior management's delay in reporting the violations was inexplicable and inexcusable. Well, uh, I agree that it's inexcusable, but I think it can be explained don't you think, uh, as a member of the board at Solomon Brothers, that senior management might have noticed Mr. Mosier's activity sooner and taken action quicker if he had been losing money? Uh, I think they probably would have noticed uh, anybody's activities in the firm that was, if they were losing a lot of money. Is, uh, 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 I, I can't argue with that. Uh, I would say this, uh, uh, Mr. Ronaldo. I, uh, I have described these activities as inexplicable and inexcusable. I hope before too long and with the aid of authorities who can immunize witnesses and, and subpoena people and prosecute for perjury, I hope that it uh, does not remain inexplicable indefinitely. It will always remain inexcusable. Thank you. I noticed on uh, page 24 of your written testimony the statement that Solomon purchased $10.6 billion out of the $11.3 billion of two-year notes offered in May of 1991. Your statement, however, did not include a calculation of the percentages. But the way I calculated, it appears to be almost 94% of the competitive bids and approximately 86% of the total auction. Now, that one firm could obtain that high a percentage of a U.S. Treasury auction is mind-blowing. And of course, it created a short squeeze. 
Perhaps as shocking is the revelation on page 30 of your testimony that Mr. Mosier proceeded to loan out the market he had cornered at an interest rate which he set. Now apparently the finance desk at Solomon just followed his instructions. In the descriptions of the responsibilities of the fired or suspended officers of Solomon contained in your testimony, none appear to have been responsible for the finance desk. Didn't the finance desk officers have to know of the corner Solomon had? And are they being held accountable for participating in this manipulative scheme, or haven't you gotten to them yet? Bob, have we interviewed the um, finance uh, desk? Uh, Larry, can you give him any help on that? Yeah. Mr. Petowitz, who uh, uh, has uh, been leading the investigation uh, since July 8th. Uh, members of the finance desk were interviewed. Could you oh, yeah, could you switch uh, that? Yeah. On your microphone, sir, and, and identify yourself in full uh, and the, uh, the, the law firm or whatever other association you have. Yes, uh, my name is Lawrence Petowitz. Uh, I'm a partner at the law firm of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Uh, yes, uh, members of the finance desk were interviewed, um, and uh, it is perfectly clear that um, they were aware of the fact that uh, they had the ability to um, set the collateral rate, but um, insofar as wrongdoing, it's entirely unclear whether um, they would have been aware of any impropriety uh, in the following sense. The rules as they presently exist. Excuse me a minute. You said it is unclear as to whether or not they were aware of any impropriety? Yes, correct. Uh, I should say uh, more accurately that uh, I have no evidence that they were aware of any impropriety in, in the following sense. The rules that currently exist permit one, a, a firm, to bid for 35 percent of the market and also permit customers as well to bid for 35 percent of the market. <clears throat> in this particular instance, um, this 10.6 billion, uh, which uh, was a very, very high percentage of that which was available, uh, was for the most part, putting aside the, uh, the so-called tiger bid, uh, legally obtained. That is, that the firm could control under present rules um, a very, very high percentage of the market and uh, then be free to uh, set the collateral market to the best of its ability. Okay, I think that explains that adequately. Uh, I want to continue with a few more questions. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Buffett, how active was the Solomon Brothers Board of Directors in managing the company? How and actively? The reason, the reason why I'm asking that question is that the board of directors, as I understand it, of a corporation such as Solomon Brothers, has a duty to oversee the officers of the company. Do you feel that perhaps the board should have been more active in overseeing the activities of the officers of the company, particularly the ones who were fired at your direction? Well, I would, I would say this, uh, uh, Mr. Ronaldo. The, the board uh, met perhaps eight times a year, something in that range, seven times. Uh, uh, the primary sources of information for a board come uh, from external auditors. That's why there's an audit committee who, has, who talks to the board in the absence of the internal management. Uh, the internal auditors of the firm uh, occasionally perhaps some anonymous letter or something of the sort comes in that might inform you, but overwhelmingly the directors do get their information from the management of the firm. And if the management of the firm is withholding information uh, until some event comes along, until the outside auditors pick up something which would not have been the case in this situation, uh, uh, it, they are going to, uh, they're going to lag if their information source is no good. Now, I think the test is what they do when they do find out about uh, what has taken place. And uh, in this case, I would say that it was a Wednesday afternoon, uh, uh, the 14th, when uh, the outside directors by phone, we were all hooked up, 
a couple were in England, one was in Alaska, at, uh, and, and we at uh, 1 o'clock Midwestern time, 2 o'clock I guess New York time, found out uh, uh, the dimensions of, uh, of what had gone on. And uh, we scheduled a meeting for the following Monday morning. It turned out because of subsequent events, we moved that up to Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. But uh, the board, when it found out, acted. Uh, it, it did not have any information, information about uh, these matters. Uh, I really don't see how if the uh, four people were hiding it from the authorities that uh, <coughs> uh, we were going to find out about it on the, at the board level. So the board had no inkling of this prior to the date that you mentioned. What I would like to know, and I think you're taking a very aggressive and appropriate stance in trying to clean up a sordid mess, but what do you see the role of the board being in the future? And by that I mean, will it play a more direct role in overseeing the operation of the firm? Will any procedures be put into effect so that the board, although it's a policy-making body, will be in a better position to determine prior to a, uh, an admission, in fact, that any illegal activity is being taking, pla taking place? Because there seemed to be a culture or attitude at Solomon by the officers that, were, that have since left that encouraged operating close to the line? Well, tomorrow there will be a board meeting, the first one since that meeting of uh, uh, the 18th. Uh, it was, was scheduled for today. We moved it. And one of our first actions will be to set up a compliance committee of the board headed by Lord Young. And uh, the chief compliance officers will report directly uh, to that committee. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether there is a compliance committee like this in existence in other publicly owned financial uh, companies in the United States, but there's going to be one at Solomon starting tomorrow. There's been a firm, uh, nationally recognized uh, auditing firm that uh, not associated with past audits that is coming in to recommend any controls or compliance procedures that they think make sense and believe me, we'll, we'll implement them. But the most, uh, I, I consider the most important thing to be on both ends of it. I, 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 that's why I've, essentially I'm the chief compliance officer and I have, I've, uh, I sent a letter out the uh, first day which, uh, first morning which I've appended to uh, my submission and uh, uh, all of the top people responsible for compliance and controls in Solomon have gotten my home phone number and they're supposed to call me first and then immediately go through normal channels if anything happens. And then at the other end I essentially have deputized every one of those 8,000 employees to behave in a way that can stand to be on the front page of the paper. And if, you know, in, in between, we're going to have all the controls and all of that, but it, it has to be at both ends of the, uh, uh, of, of the barrel also. Gentlemen's time thank you, Mr. has well, thank you, Mr. expired. Thank you. Uh, could I ask Mr. Buffett that uh, as part of that uh, September 10th correspondence with us that you also send along these new compliance procedures which you are going to uh, uh, consider tomorrow, adopt hopefully we will do so. at the firm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let me add as well, parenthetically, that along with uh, Mr. Dingle and uh, Mr. Wyden, we are drafting a comprehensive uh, set of uh, auditing uh, reforms that will put uh, legal responsibility upon outside auditors uh, as part of our version of the banking reform bill uh, that will uh, ensure that we fill that hole that has been out there throughout the 1980s. And uh, just for the record, that is going to be a part of any package that emanates from the uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. And Mr. Dingle and I and Mr. Wyden have been working on that over the last several months. Gen gen uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Buffett, I applaud the early moves that you have made as Chairman of Solomon. Uh, it seems to me that adequate reporting and disclosure should be an absolute prerequisite for par uh, participation in the government securities market. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that that would be imposing onerous requirements on the industry. Would the required dissemination of such information of all kinds be a proper a requirement across the board in your industry? Mm -hmm. Mr. Scheuer, I, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I agree that the ability to be a primary dealer is a, is a privilege and that, uh, that uh, whatever the authorities think are the the, the, the materials they need in order to do their job, 
uh, they're going to get from us. I, I have no quarrel with that at all. But, uh, well, I think I, I think on top of that, we ought to even go beyond that in our own place. But I, I understand, but I I, I just don't uh, I don't think that you would want to reveal positions to the public that might tell what you thought was going to go up the next day or down the next day. But in terms of in terms of uh, knowing where we stand, I mean, it, it, I think I think the position that. Uh, Mr. Ronaldo described as mind-blowing. I think that that is a pretty good description. I would accept that characterization. And uh, there shouldn't be mind-blowing uh, positions that exist uh, uh, with government bond dealers. Right. Well, I don't think any of us want to overreact and impose onerous and expensive and difficult and time-consuming reporting requirements. But at least the minimum reporting, it seems to most of us, ought to be done. And it seems that a refusal to provide market information uh, by Salomon's partners in the government securities uh, industry uh, certainly invites burdensome regulation by this Congress. And what we have to do, it seems to me, is to fine tune what we require to what is necessary and appropriate. Uh, Mr. Shorey, I, I think, you know, eventually what we would want is we would want the government, the U.S. government, to borrow at the lowest possible cost consistent with all other external factors and we would want the least cost to be interposed by the market between the issue of the securities and who finally ends up buying them and the, what I would call the frictional cost of distributing the securities and if the government gets the lowest interest cost and the lowest distribution <laughs> cost I think that I mean that's the eventual goal that's the name of the game and that's yeah. what we need to protect yeah. the public and I think uh, so. investors of all kinds overseas and at home I thank the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Slattery. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I uh, share Chairman Dingell's concern about whether our regulatory agencies really have the capacity to monitor what is going on in our financial markets these days, whether we're talking about the regulation of derivative securities in the international marketplace or the kind of activity that, that we are learning about here today. And I'm just curious, from, from your experience um, in Omaha prior to assuming your present duties, and, uh, and based on what you've learned in the last month, do you believe that the SEC, for example, has the uh, resources to do the job that the public really is expecting it to do? Well, I would say this. I, I do think more of my experience has been in equity markets than, than in, in, in debt markets. And I, think the, I, I do think the United States has the best equity markets in the world. And I think that one of the reasons that we do uh, one of the major reasons, perhaps the major reason, but certainly one of the major reasons is the fact that the SEC has, has behaved over the years as they have. They are recognized, I think, as being a, a tough cop. And I think that uh, uh, securities markets uh, uh, can use that. So I, uh, I can't tell you exactly. I, I don't know the budget of the SEC, and I don't know, uh, I don't know that much about uh, exactly even how it's distributed within it. But my guess is that... Uh, Whatever what's, the enforcement the division among, gets, they're earning their money. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the talk among the people out on the street? I mean, do they do they look at the SEC as a, a tough cop they have to deal with? Do they think of the SEC as as an agency that, that you can work around pretty easily? I mean, what's what's sort of the talk on the street I, about? I think the SEC is looked at, a, at as a, as a tough cop. I do not think they are looked at as a paper tiger at all. The SEC is it's been a long reputation. You build that reputation over decades, and I think that uh, people. Uh, in enforcement uh, in the SEC, I think there's a certain uh, maybe type of, uh, uh, I mean this in the very best sense, but I, I think that there's a feeling they can attract uh, young people out of school who could probably earn a lot more money elsewhere and that there's a certain Marine Corps mentality about getting the job done and I think they've done a great job in that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Buffett, I'm changing subject here on you, but um, uh, how was Mr. Mosier compensated? Was he compensated with a salary? and a commission, primarily commission, or do you know? Yeah, I, I do know. Uh, almost all of the top executives of Solomon, including uh, Mr. Mosier, 
were compensated by a, uh, what they would have regarded anyway as a relatively small salary uh, and uh, uh, very large bonuses. Now, the bonuses were not strictly, not commissions at all. I, I don't believe there's anyone at Solomon that's paid on a commission basis, including salespeople. But certainly, it was a reflection in a significant way, not exclusively, but a significant way of the profitability of the areas under their control. So it, uh, it, it was not a commission on any specific transaction or the month or anything of the sort. But, but they the would end get of, big bonuses at, at the, the end, end, end of the year. year they got a bonus. And, it, and, and the better the year they had, the bigger the bonus they expected. Mm -hmm. um, I would like for you, if you could, to, uh, and I know in your written testimony you've provided some detail on this, but I'd like for the oral record to show uh, a, a discussion and an explanation from your standpoint about really, really what happened. I mean, there's some very serious charges that are being, being made here, charges about price fixing, uh, the sale of, of billions of dollars worth of securities. This is, this is a very, very serious charge, and I'm just curious, did it happen? Why did it happen? Well, Tell us in, what, in what, layman's what language it, what you think happened. You know, what we put in the submission, I believe, happened. I mean, it, 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 and, um, it's hard to characterize it entirely, but it, 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 it and I, once I've said something is inexplicable, I guess I shouldn't try and explain it, but I will. The, uh, uh, in the middle of 1990, in July of 1990, Mr. Mosier, I believe it was July, put in a bid with the U.S. Treasury for an issue that they were handling for the, I believe, the Resolution Funding Corp, where he bid for more than 100 percent of the issue. And I believe at the time there was no law against bidding for more than 100 percent of the issue. You, Tell you, us you could, how he did that. I think, uh, to my knowledge, uh, you fill out a form and, and, uh, and uh, if the issue is 10 billion and you bid for 11 billion, at that time there was no rule against that. There was a rule that you could not obtain more than 35 percent of the issue so that uh, the proration factor would be applied against this larger bid. and. Uh, if you thought the issue would be heavily prorated down, you might bid for more than 100 percent, knowing that the 35 percent would be the maximum. The Treasury, as I understand it, found that bid so outrageous, uh, and I have some sympathy for their feelings, they, that they rejected the bid entirely and then put in new regulations that said you could not bid for more than 35 percent of, 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 uh, of the issue, uh, as well as not obtain more than 35 percent. Mr. Mosier was a critic of that rule. And in effect, I think, in some way, felt that, uh, and I'm, I, I, I'm guessing at behavior, but that the, the Treasury was challenging him. And uh, uh, in December, uh, operating under the new rule, he first did something that, uh, that was illegal by submitting a bid for somebody else that he could not have submitted if it had been aggregated with Solomon, for somebody that had totally innocent party. Who did? Who was that? Who was the uh, other? It was Warburg, I believe. That, Pardon me. I think it was it was the Warburg firm uh, that, that that he did that on. The Warburg they, firm. They are so an innocent party. As so my let own. me let me just interject sure. so that we can get a clearer understanding. So you're telling us then that in December, uh, Mr. Mosier actually submitted a bid for the Warburg firm that he was not authorized to do. As far as I know, Warburg had never. Uh, 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 Never heard of it. Uh, he just he pulled a name out of the hat, probably a name that he thought would might cause him the least trouble. But he but he he, uh, mm -hmm. he submitted a bid for Warburg, which Warburg had nothing to do with. And then when he obtained a proration on the bonds for Warburg, as he did on pro, he, he he essentially transferred those over to the account of Solomon, so that Warburg never saw the bonds. I mean, they, they had no connection with it. And uh, he ended up with more bonds from that auction than he would have obtained if he'd only submitted a legitimate bid. Now, that was the first one, the first one we know of. And I, 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 mm -hmm. we've looked at 45 auctions, and we'll keep looking. And, and we've got other people helping us look. But in February, a couple of months later, he submitted three bids for 35 percent each, totaling 105 percent of the issue. Would have been interesting if they'd all been awarded to him. Uh, the uh, used two other, uh, used two names, again unauthorized, to obtain far more bonds than he could have if he'd followed the rules and just submitting a legitimate 35 percent bid. Now, that 
triggered the second offense triggered a Treasury reaction which led to the situation in late April where I think Mr. Mosier knew that events were underway that were going to cause him to be caught. And uh, uh, at that point, he informed his superior, who informed three other superiors, so that four people in senior management of the firm became aware of what Mr. Mosier had done. He said he'd only, according to the t what they tell us, he only told them of the one incident. Um, it really gets inexplicable at this point because clearly the whole thing was going to unravel at some point. The, 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 the Treasury was looking at it, uh, and Mr. Mosier then, in the May auction, uh, did the events, uh, did the things that uh, don't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's almost like a self-destruct mechanism. That they, there was no way that you were going to have a security behave as that May 22nd issue behaved in the aftermarket, which, uh, without attracting the attention of the whole world, journalists were writing about it. The SEC looked into it. It, it, there was, it, 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 it was not the act of a rational man at all. My, my time has expired, Mr. Buffett, and I appreciate your response. And I guess the only point I would make in summation here is, is that, that, that Mr. Mosier's superiors learned of his misconduct uh, as early as April. La in, and in then, late and April, they learned of Subsequent to, to their learning of this, there was another auction where he had again repeated what he had done previously, in, sort of in spades. And uh, is that not the... That, that's correct. That is okay. correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for your indulgence also. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Buffett, I have a, a question not relevant to what you're doing right now at, uh, at Solomon, but relevant to how this committee and the Congress should, should proceed given the reauthorization. It seems to me that, uh, that there's a problem that exists here. We're in the 200th anniversary, the, uh, the government bond market was created in 1791. And for an awful long time, we have sold an awful lot of debt prosecute our wars, our, our ambitious undertakings as, as a nation. And uh, we have now only over the last few years uh, really almost a bit of a reluctant regulator and could create the risk if Mr. Michael Basham, De Deputy Assistant to Treasury Secretary, is to believe where the issuer of the bond will also be the regulator of the market into which it is sold. Because Treasury says, well, I'm not sure we need to do anything, but if you're going to do anything, it ought to be us. You have a breadth of experience. Can I ask you to react to that observation? Well, I don't think it's impossible for someone that is issuing just counting all refundings and everything, um, many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars worth of bonds. They, they, ought to, they should have, and, and I believe they do have, but they should have a definite interest in getting that done at the lowest possible cost, the lowest possible distribution cost, and with a minimization of, of an, an elimination, really, of any question about the integrity of that market. So uh, I would say the motivation would be there to do that job. I, and, and, uh, I will tell you everything I know about, and, and continue to, everything I know about how the, the market operates. Uh, I'll let uh, you make the judgment when you get the facts in as to who can do the job best. I, I will go back to the fact that I absolutely believe that you should have tough rules, tough cops, and tough prosecution. Now, whatever gets that job done best, I think is, uh, uh, I'm for. I guess my concern is, is that the secondary market seems to be the point of abuse. It's where you can go out and, and have some fun. And what were perceived to be tiny cracks really are big crevasses into which uh, most anything can, uh, 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 can fall. The GAO told us uh, that sales practice rules that supplement the basic anti-fraud provisions of the security laws have become a fixture. Quote, if these rules make sense for other securities markets, then they also make sense for the government market as well because there are similar opportunities for abuse. You concur with that GAO observation? Well, I would say 
there are opportunities for abuse. I would say that the government market is somewhat different than the equity market. It, 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 uh, you're dealing with almost homogeneous securities, not identical. I mean, they, 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 they'll, but within any given maturity range, you're dealing with almost homogeneous securities. That is the reason why when the squeeze of sorts appeared in that May 22nd auction, everyone knew about it within a very short period of time. It, it, uh, it was obvious. You, you could look at the yield curve and you would see this one issue, 20 basis points out of line or something of the sort. You know that, that there's something going on in that issue. I, I should say, I do, I do not believe anyone, any group, could possibly rig the, the Treasury market as a whole. But a given issue like that, I, I think there's some possibilities. I have one suggestion on that, incidentally. I, I, would, I would say this, that, that squeezes or corners have happened both accidentally and intentionally over the years. Probably the most famous one was the Northern Pacific Corner in 1901, which was accidental. You had two fellows that wanted to get control of a railroad, and they each bought more than half the stock, and that causes a problem. Uh, you've had plenty of people that have tried to intentionally uh, corner securities. The one thing that does in a corner or a squeeze is more supply. I mean, in the old days when they tried to squeeze uh, corn delivery in, in, in Chicago, they try and keep the railroad cars from getting there, and if the railroad cars got there, it was, the corner was no good. And so the, an additional supply takes care of things, uh, and it, 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 as you put it, takes all the fun out of it. There, 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 there's no sense trying to squeeze or corner something except for profit. The, if the Treasury, tr Treasury has a natural rhythm to its, its, its financing. Anybody that finances as much as they ought to should have a natural rhythm because you don't want to surprise markets. But I, if, and they're probably, like most simple solutions, there's probably something wrong with this, but I think if, if, if I were in a position to influence the policy, I would say that any time an issue appeared to be behaving abnormally in the market, I would, I would have the world on notice that the Treasury was prepared to issue a lot more of that particular security in one hell of a hurry and essentially, I think the game would be over in terms of people trying to squeeze issues in the secondary market. If, if the people who did, who did what, whatever happened in the May 22nd auction had felt that the Treasury might come back a month later with 10 billion more of those notes, and bear in mind they were selling at too low a yield basis so that, in, in effect, it's kind of advantageous financing, well, it wouldn't have happened in the first place if that, if that willingness had been understood. So I think the very presence of that attitude would tend to it, I think it would eliminate the squeeze problem. Now, that there, you've got a lot more problems than that, but I, I, I wanted to attack that specific point. I'm afraid, though, that Congress may rush out to go spend the money to incur the debt to issue that, uh, that new bond. <laughs> I thank, uh, thank the Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Buffett, I'm interested in what you possibly know about what the regulators knew about what was going on and, and when did they know it, paraphrase an old uh, expression. Um, I was reading the post today and I was trying to ascertain what uh, Chairman Breeden was saying about this in terms of, of the subpoenas, uh, subpoenas that, he has, uh, that he has issued. And uh, I'm not sure about this, but uh, some of the conclusions I, I would re reach it would be that the SEC waited until August to actually subpoena the market participants about their trading activities when, in fact, the Commission knew about those activities prior to that, possibly as early as May. Are you, are you familiar with any of the Commission's knowledge with this regard? Mr. McMillan, I'm, I'm really not familiar with, with their timetable. I know what Treasury did uh, that started the process in motion that caused the four people to be aware uh, at Solomon in late April. Uh, and I, I, I'm quite clear on that. I'm not clear in terms of the Department of Justice, in terms of, uh, in terms of the SEC. I'm not, I'm not clear on timing. Uh, uh, well, there was a letter request, I'm in, and, and I remember this now, there was a letter request by the SEC in late June for information about the May 22nd auction. And, and, and uh, um, that is, uh, I, I know nothing about their internal procedures on timing after that. Well, let me back up a second. Just maybe uh, some of your uh, 
your, your folks here could help us on this. But what I'm interested in, I mean, I understand that primary dealers make regular reports to the Federal Reserve about their positions. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is what kind of reporting was done to the regulators that if there was a real watchful eye, they could have picked this up. Uh, it seems to me, um, unless these reports were, uh, were uh, uh, it, first, of, well, first question I want to ask, are there regular reports to some government agency that would indicate the kind of position that Solomon Brothers took uh, in these government auctions? Yeah, uh, and uh, if I may ask Mr. Petowitz, uh, on the, would they have been aware would the, the, the would reports have gone daily that would have shown, for example, the quantum position after May 22nd, and then show the total held by Solomon for for itself and customers? I or even earlier in some of the other transgressions. Yeah. The uh, the Federal Reserve uh, would have re been receiving fairly regular reports about Solomon's positions and uh, would have been aware was aware of the size of its position and its customers' positions at the end of May. So there is actual reporting that Solomon does to the Federal Reserve about its own account and its customer accounts to the Federal Reserve. Is that the only federal agency that would receive those kinds of reports? That is my understanding. So you're, what you're saying is that the Federal Reserve would have had the information in hand to have detected this back at its earliest date. They would have had information that would have permitted them to know the size of Salomon's and its customers' positions, but would not have had the ability, I believe, uh, to detect the illegality that was associated with uh, th that auction and earlier auctions. When was the first date that you heard from the Federal Reserve with regards to these problems? Approximately so. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the problem I'm having with the question is the uh, suggestion that there was a problem. Uh, I th the Federal Reserve, I think, must have come, become concerned in May about the size of Salomon's position and its customers' positions. And uh, there were, as I understand it, informal discussions between the, uh, the government trading desk and the Federal Reserve concerning the size of those positions. Mm -hmm. And in addition, assurances were given that uh, these the government trading desk would not permit fails to occur uh, in the collateral market. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand before this committee goes forward with further legislation and further in encumbrances, what I'm trying to understand is, does, is the flow of information right now sufficient to federal regulators to have detected this kind of activity? And the answer to that I presumably is yes. Is that correct? I, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the beginning is of the, the question. Is the flow of information to the federal regulators suffi sufficient to have detected uh, this kind, these kinds of positions? Insofar as the illegal bids are concerned, clearly not, because nobody could have known that except the people that were perpetrating the crimes. I see what you're saying. But insofar as the, um, the very large positions that were associated with, the, with May is concerned, right. that is the, uh, the Salomon position together with the customer positions, the Federal Reserve uh, was clearly aware of the size of the positions, and press reports suggest, uh, in addition, that the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and the SEC had begun to look at this uh, very carefully at the end of May and uh, had decided uh, that for reasons of investigation, um, that is, to watch how this played itself out a little while before uh, launching a full investigation. But in other words, the Federal Reserve knew in May that there were positions exceeding the 35 percent women. Is that correct? No. No. Uh, what they would have been aware of is that Salomon had bid 35 percent and received very close to 35 percent, that uh, Quantum Fund bid 35 percent and received 35 percent, which they were entitled to, and that the Tiger Fund had um, apparently bid $2 billion and received $2 billion. And all these funds are related to? And who, who, who are the, these the bids were put in through Solomon, and Solomon uh, controlled uh, the collateral. And, 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 and that, as I understand it, would have been available to the Federal Reserve, and that would, would have looked like a very big number, I would think. Well, again, I was trying to get to the, the heart of this, but I, again, I, the SEC uh, decided to subpoena the market participants in August, when in fact, maybe in May, they may have seen the, the red flags. I think they did see the red flags in May uh, and in June, and the SEC had begun an investigation. I believe they were cooperating with the other agencies. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I appreciate uh, giving us a better uh, understanding of some of the timing on this because, I, again, it's my concern that so much of this regulation is after the fact, oftentimes when it's in the press, and uh, I, I'm not sure that's a necessarily appropriate way to regulate our financial institutions by revelations in the newspaper. So I certainly appreciate your, uh, your comments in that regard. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell. Mr. Buffett, I read here a list of the management of the market by government regulators. For example, in the case of, the, of government securities, there is no review of the distribution process. But in the case of equities and corporate debt, there is. In the case of broker-dealer registration requirements, there is in each of the three markets, equities, corporate debt, and government securities. In the case of sales practice rules, there is no sales practice rules applicable or, or formulated by any regulator uh, with regard to people in government securities. But there are, there, there are such rules in the case of equities and corporate debt. In the case of broker-dealer personnel, uh, testing. It is limited in the case of government securities, but it is, it is mandatory in the case of equities and corporate debt. Record keeping requirements are available in all three of the markets. Financial reporting is available in all three remark, uh, markets. Financial responsibility in all three. Limited, uh, limited SIPC coverage in the case of government securities, but there is a requirement for it in the case of equities and corporate debt. Uh, in the case of a surveillance program, which appears to be something which is very important, there is one in the equities market and in the corporate and, and uh, none in the corporate debt. But I note that there is no surveillance program in the government securities market. I note that there is no large trader reporting in the case of government securities. One is proposed in the case of equities and one in the case of corporate debt. Uh, there are no rules and no, uh, by the Commission or any self-regulatory agency of anti-manipulation rules in the case of government securities. Uh, in the case of equities, there is. Uh, and in the case of corporate debt, there are such rules. There is no requirement for trans transparency in the marketplace with regard to government securities. But uh, there, there is such authority in the case each of equities and corporate debt. I'm curious. Uh, the 35 percent purchase that we, are, we have been discussing here, plus the purchase of, of other securities by uh, the same individual nominally for some, some, some other person, uh, apparently fell within the purview of what could be the uh, question of manipulation or anti-manipulation rules or manipulation of the market. Am I correct in that understanding? Well, it certainly seems to me that, that, that it's a crime. I don't, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what statute it comes under or anything of the sort, but, uh, but uh, so when somebody puts in a phony bid to the United States government for, uh, for uh, bonds trying to get around their rules as to the maximum that should be bid for, I, I, I don't, again, I don't know where it falls, but it should fall someplace. I'm not trying to put you in, in, in a pit. I want you to understand. This, 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 these, this is not a, a, a trap or a question of that sort. I'm curious, though, uh, is your efforts to supervise, if you had anti-manipulation rules, you'd have an easier time, would you not? If you were the supervisor, you ought to have plenty of rules that take care of people doing what, what, what happened. But, uh, and, and if you had a surveillance program, it'd be easier for the supervisors, would it not? Yes, but I, I, I agree with that, Mr. Chairman. I just don't know what the surveillance was, but I, uh, but I, uh, I agree that that when people are participating in a market that involves hundreds of billions of dollars, that, that there should be a surveillance program. And I noted again that there, that there are uh, no, no sales practice rules. Again, for your supervision, that kind of uh, rule would be easier uh, for you to supervise if you had such rules in place by an appropriate federal regulatory institution. Would, would no, we're going to have plenty of rules of our own, in, but I don't. Uh, that, you know, I, I think that uh, government rules should be a, a, the appropriate ones and the minimum ones, and we hope to go beyond it. 
Now, I note, again, there's no distribution, uh, no review of the distribution process in the case of government securities. Uh, again, your task in supervising uh, people would be made easier if you had something of that kind available. Yeah. Would it not? I'm not sure whether we, do we supply the names of all purchasers to the, to the Fed? Yeah, I, I, my, my impression is that the, that in terms of the distribution that does take place, unless somebody is cheating and, 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 and puts a phony ticket in and then as happened at, at Solomon in several cases, uh, I think that, uh, I, I do think the Federal Reserve does receive the name of purchasers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Let me ask you this, Mr. Buffett, in conclusion. Could you give us a one-minute summary of what you want us to remember as your core message as we move through uh, the legislative process and, uh, and consider also expansion of further deregulatory matters, uh, uh, areas of the banking uh, uh, industry over this uh, coming fall? I guess I'm not sure I can drag it out to one minute, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do believe in, when, with markets of this size, equities, debt, whatever, the integrity of markets uh, is uh, paramount. And I think that we will always have uh, people who misbehave in our midst and that probably uh, uh, too many will be attracted to large markets, but that uh, the presence of uh, tough rules and tough cops, sure and swift prosecution is probably the best thing that can be done to minimize it. Mr. Buffett, uh, we thank you. Uh, you once wrote, I believe, in the Washington Post uh, that if you uh, really wanted to make money, hold your nose and head towards Wall Street. Uh, while your, the timing and the purpose of your trip to Wall Street may not have been similarly uh, motivated, I hope that you can keep your hand on, the, uh, on your own nose and the other firmly on the rudder of Solomon Brothers uh, as you uh, continue to be in the vanguard of reform, uh, not only in your own firm, but across this entire marketplace. And I think that your legacy can, ben, can be of one of tremendous public service. Uh, and uh, and uh, I want to tell you that we admire and respect you for what you've done in the past and, uh, and for your cooperation here today. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much, Mr. Buffett. Um, our second uh, uh, panel uh, consists of the uh, federal uh, regulators who have a jurisdiction uh, in this uh, area. They consist of the Honorable Richard Breeden, Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission.